Welcome back to the heart. We are working on the intrinsic conduction system. And, well, actually, we had just, just to recap, um, we had ended by talking about the action potentials. Now what we're going to talk about is what happens in the heart as this action potential travels through the cells of the intrinsic conduction system. We are not going to go over exactly what the action potential in the intrinsic conduction system would look like. We're going to assume it's going to look something like this because the conductive fibers are not autorhythmic, so they're not going to have the, uh, can't speak today, the pacemaker or pre-potential that you see here. Um, so what we're doing is tracking this action potential. Um, and because depolarization happens first, I am sometimes prone to say we're, we're tracking the wave of depolarization as it flows through the heart, right? Because it's the depolarization which causes the calcium release that causes the contraction. So that's what we're really concerned with is how are the different parts of the heart depolarized because that's what stimulates them to contract. So then with the intrinsic conduction system, it is a combination of contractile and conductive fibers. We're not going to worry so much about which is which. We just want to know the order in which they act. They are listed here, right? It's sinoatrial node, atrioventricular node, AV bundle, right and left bundle branches, and the Purkinje fibers. Purkinje is just one of my favorite words to say. I don't know why. Uh, so this is an essay question on the exam. It's relatively straightforward. Um, it, it's, there's five points that you want to make, so it might feel like a lot to write, but most of it is just listing the parts in the proper order. So you want to be able to stay, say that um, the depolarization starts at the sinoatrial node, which is going to generate this impulse or generate the action potential. Don't worry about the time or timing. Uh, so when we're looking at this, you just want to note where they have the little arrows here, right? So that is the start of depolarization. And then the purple shows it spreading across the atria. So when the atria are purple, like they are in this picture here, that means your atria are uniformly or almost uniformly depolarized. Then the depolarization, whoops, I made some mistakes. There we go. Uh, stops, I'll recircle that, right there at the AV node. So this delay in the impulse is important. I want you to put it in the essay question. The reason why it's there is because you want the atria to contract before the ventricles contract. So you want to have that brief pause in between atrial depolarization and all of this purple ventricular depolarization so the atria have a moment to perform their contraction before the ventricles start their contraction. So it goes to the AV node, pauses there for a moment. Then it is going to hit the AV bundle, which is just that one line right there. Can I make this a different color or darker so it stands out? Right, the AV bundle just goes from there to there. So it's just that straight part right there, which I have now way over marked up, but you get what I'm talking about. Um, so the AV bundle is the electrical connection between the atria and the ventricles. You don't need to explain all of this in your essay. You just need to be able to say it goes from the AV node to the AV bundle, which is the connection to the ventricles. If you look at this picture over here and look really closely, the myocardium of the ventricles starts here, and the myocardium of the atria are there. So there's just this tiny little sliver here in between the ventricular myocardium and the atrial myocardium. And you can see the same thing over here 
where right, the ventricular myocardium comes up to about here, and then you've got a little gap there. So what you're never going to get is spreading of the action potential from the atria down through the ventricular walls. So the only electrical connection runs through that AV bundle, or the bundle of Hiss. So AV bundle next, then into the two bundle branches. Um, so here, that's this part here where the bundle branches are purple. Then it goes up the Purkinje fibers, and they depolarize the walls of the ventricles. Um, so when we're here, this is number five, that's five here. Now our ventricles are uniformly depolarized. Now they are going to contract. So again, what you need to be able to say is depolarization starts at the sinoatrial node, which generates impulses or initiates the action potential. It'll then travel to the AV node, where it pauses for a tenth of a second. Then it travels through the AV bundle, which connects the atria to the ventricles. Then the bundle branches carry it down the septum, and the Purkinje fibers run from the apex up through the walls of the ventricles, um, causing the ventricular walls to uniformly depolarize. So that's the whole thing. It's five sentences or five sentence fragments, but you need to be able to type that whole thing out on the next exam. Um, imbalances. These you can just um, read about. I will not talk about them too much. Um, you want to know what arrhythmia is. You want to know what fibrillation is. Um, later on, we will talk about um, increased heart rate, decreased heart rate, heart rate, excuse me. We want to contrast that with fibrillation. So if your heart rate increases, let's say you just sprinted a quarter, well, you can't sprint a quarter mile, but whatever, you sprinted as far as you can sprint, your heart rate's going to be up over 120. That is not fibrillation. That is rapid, but it is coordinated and part of homeostasis. Fibrillation is when it is more rapid than it needs to be and irregular. So it's almost more like sometimes uh, like spasms or vibrations and those contractions, because they're either too short or uncoordinated, um, don't generate enough force to actually move the blood. So it's just the heart quivering. Um, you do want to know partial heart block, because that'll come in handy when we're looking at the ECG in a few minutes. Um, so just read what it says there. It just prevents the action potential from traveling through the SA node and then into the ventricles. Oh, here we are, tachycardia, bradycardia. Again, tachycardia, increased heart rate. Um, not necessarily a sign of pathology. If you have just run 50 yards as fast as you can, you are going to have an increased heart rate. This is normal. Um, if you're sitting in the car in traffic and your heart rate goes up, that is not normal. That is a panic attack or some other problem. Um, with homeostasis. And then bradycardia is a decreased heart rate. Again, it is not necessarily indicative of pathology, but it could be. It just depends. All right, then we get on to the electrocardiogram or ECG. This, I want to, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Emphasize that this is not describing what is going on inside your heart. So when we look at this figure here, right, it looks a lot like our, uh, whatever you call these things, action potentials. Because um, you've got time on the x-axis and voltage on the y-axis. But what you're measuring here is the electrical field of your body. So you're not looking at the membrane potential whether it is positive to negative or positive or negative inside relative to outside. You are looking at the electrical state of where one electrode is placed versus where another electrode is placed. 
So the analogy I use here is like trying to figure out if you're looking at the surface of a river, how deep is the river and how irregular and bumpy is the bottom of the river by looking at the surface, right? If you have a very deep river, even if the water is flowing rather quickly, the surface of the water will look relatively flat. It'll be ripply, but not all crazy. If you see lots of bubbles um, and undulations and waves being created in slowly moving water, you know that it's probably not as deep because disturbances at the bottom of the river are um, causing disturbances in the water on the top of the river. And if you see swirls and eddies and all kinds of stuff going on on the surface of the water, then you know that there are deep pockets and shallow pockets and rocks in different places on the surface of the water. So what the ECG is, is simply monitoring the electrical activity on the surface of the body and then correlating that to what is going on inside the heart. So, um, yeah, we'll just leave it at that. This is not a direct measurement of heart activity. It is the effect of different kinds of electrical activity in the heart on the electrical field of the body as measured by electrodes on the skin. So nobody is sticking an electrode in somebody's heart to measure depolarization of the heart. We're going to talk about depolarization and relate it to changes that we see in the ECG. So if you've never done one before, there's a standard three lead ECG, which is not what you would get at the hospital. They would do like a 10 or 12 lead. They put a positive electrode on one hand, a negative electrode on another, and then usually a ground on one of your ankles or they can put these electrodes on your chest if they want to get a little bit more accurate. And then they just monitor the voltage difference between this electrode and that electrode as your heart does what it does. So a normal three lead ECG will look something like this. Now, this slide right here tells you everything you need to know about the ECG. So it is not, your understanding of it does not have to be super complicated. So first up you have the P wave followed by what is called the QRS complex and then wherever these lines are flat those are called isoelectric lines. So you've got P wave, isoelectric lines, QRS complex, isoelectric line, T wave, and then another isoelectric line or flat line before the next P wave. So the P wave is what it looks like on the surface of your body when your SA node depolarizes. The QRS complex is what it looks like on the surface of your body when your ventricles depolarize. So you'll note this looks like a hyperpolarization, depolarization, repolarization, right? It's a complicated three-part deflection wave on the ECG, but that's just because the complicated 3D journey that the depolarization takes through your heart. That's why all this up and down happens on your skin because of the um, complicated anatomy of the intrinsic conduction system as it moves through your heart. Now, your atria are going to repolarize at the same time as your QRS complex, but they do not cause any of the deflections from the isoelectric line that you see in the QRS complex. And in the next slide, I'll show you uh, an ECG tracing that proves just that point. Then when your ventricles repolarize, that's what causes your T wave. So again, this looks like a depolarization because the line is going up, but we're measuring what's happening on your skin and correlating it to what's going on in the heart. So this up deflection T wave represents your downward repolarization in your ventricles. So on the lab exam, actually not lab exam, on the next exam, what I will do is give you a tracing and instead of the tracing being labeled P, Q, R, S, and T, 
the three time periods will be labeled one, two, and three, or A, B, and C. And then I will ask individual short answer essay questions about the different time periods. So, you know, what is the deflection wave in time period one called? And what does it represent in the heart? And you would say one is the P wave and it represents depolarization of the atria. So that would be three or four, depending on how I want to break it up, different questions about the ECG. You're not going to have to draw it. You're not going to have to explain the whole thing. And you're not going to have to relate it to um, the events in the intrinsic conduction system. So then looking at this real quick, there are two things I wanted to point out. Um, well, three, actually. Here's your normal sinus rhythm. Uh, here we have junctional rhythm, which this is, as it says here, the SA node is non-functional. Um, so there are no P waves. That also means that it is your AV node that is setting your resting heart rate. Um, so that, that is what's making your sinus rhythm. And because your AV node doesn't depolarize as fast as your SA node, your heart rate slows down when you have a junctional rhythm, which you can kind of see here. These are kind of on a different scale, it looks like. Um, but this is supposed to be a slower heart rate than the normal sinus rhythm. Ooh, I went too fast. Uh, here, this is second degree heart block. There's one thing I want to point out here, and I'll see if I can make that bigger for everybody. Um, so we'll just look right here. Here you have P, Q, R, S, T, P, nothing, and then P, Q, R, S, T, P wave, and nothing. So where's my pointer, right? This line right here um, is where that Q, R, S complex would normally be. But because the depolarization never makes it to the ventricles, you don't get a QRS complex. Now you do have a P wave, that's right here, and right there, and right there. Um, but you don't get anything here, which means nothing happens on the ECG when your ventricles repolarize. We can see the depolarization on the ECG, but when they repolarize, that just doesn't register on the surface. And I'm not exactly sure why. It might be that it is um, not as large of an electrical event as ventricular repolarization. And it might just happen slow enough that it doesn't register on the surface. Um, so there's that. Uh, again, you just need to know this stuff. But I explain this stuff because reinforces some of the stuff I want you to know and it just makes life more interesting. Moving right along, why won't that? There we go. Um, these are definitions. Just know them. Uh, this also, so now we are on to the cardiac cycle. Um, first we just want to define systole as being contraction. It doesn't matter whether it's ventricular or atrial, they both go through systole. And diastole is relaxation. Usually, because the ventricles are what are moving the blood, um, usually if somebody just says this happens during diastole or this happens during systole, they're referring to ventricular diastole or ventricular systole. Uh, the way I keep the two straight is to remember that systole has an O and can... Oh, no, wait, what do I remember? Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. I remember that systole is the squeeze, right? So contraction is squeezing, systole is squeezing, and then diastole sounds like relaxation. So I just emphasize the a ah in both of the words, and that works for me. Um, then this slide, not hugely important, but it is nice to know. Um, what you want to know is that for either chamber, contraction is going to follow depolarization. So if we just look, say, here, he, here is atria relaxing. Then you get atrial depolarization. And following the beginning of atrial depolarization, right, if I draw a line straight down, there's a little gap here before the atria go into systole. And then the same thing here. So here's the ventricles relaxing. 
And at this point right here is when they start to depolarize, but they don't start to contract until about two thirds of the way through the QRS complex. Um, so you just want to know that um, there's always going to be a little gap in between depolarization and contraction of a chamber. And then the same thing with relaxation. Um, there's a gap between the repolarization and the full relaxation. Um, then we get into the cardiac cycle. Um, this uh, would probably be best served being an essay question, but I don't think it's important enough to make it an essay question. Um, and to me, it's just kind of confusing because I never know what to pull out as the most important points. Um, but so the way it's drawn here, um, we start our, our understanding of the cardiac cycle at late diastole during ventricular filling. That's where the one is. And then the second phase is ventricular systole. And then the third phase is the beginning of diastole. So everything that's blue there is diastole, which we divide up into late and early diastole. So we start our understanding of the cardiac cycle in late diastole. This is when the ventricles are fully relaxed and filling passively with blood. There are two things here that are important to know about ventricular filling or the first phase. One is that your AV valves are open. Um, and if your AV valves are open, that means your semilunar valves are closed. So that's this, this guy here is closed and that guy there is closed. What I just drew is too small for you to see. Um, and then the other thing to remember is that 80% of the blood that fills your ventricles does so passively and the contraction of the atria only packs in an additional 20% of the blood. So ventricular filling, AV valves open, semilunar valves closed, blood flowing passively into the ventricles. Then you get into ventricular systole. So the blood is going to flow out here. I don't know if you can see the arrow and out there. That is going to force the semilunar valves open and then the AV valves will close because you're increasing the pressure in your, in your ventricles. So blood wants to flow back up into the atria, back up here or back up over there, but the AV valves close and prevent that. So you enter ventricular systole, your AV valves close, your semilunar valves open. Then in late diastole, um, yeah, sorry, um, doesn't matter. Early diastole, early to mid diastole, um, your semilunar valves are going to close. And then towards the end up here, your AV valves are going to open. But that's sort of the beginning of the next round. So for each phase, as I have them marked here, one, two, and three, um, know which valves are open and which valves are closed, and 80% of the blood that enters the ventricles does so passively. Then we're going to layer on top of that um, our heart sound. So most people, when they talk about the heart, say it goes like bump, 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 or some books call it a lub-dub. So the first heart sound, the love, is your AV valves slamming shut. And the second heart sound, the dub, is your semilunar valves slamming shut. So you'll notice, right, here's your QRS complex. Here's ventricular systole. And somewhere a little bit after systole has begun, once enough pressure has been generated, that forces the AV valve shut. And then when the ventricles go into diastole, um, some short time afterwards later, the back pressure from your atria and your pulmonary valve are what's going to slam your semilunar valves shut. So if we go back to here, right, when those semilunar valves slam shut, that's back pressure in that direction, causing that semilunar valve to slam shut. 
notes were there, were there. Then, oh, cardiac output. How far in are we? We're 25 minutes. We'll try and get through um, cardiac output as quickly as we can, but it is somewhat complicated. So the first thing you want to know is the, can't speak, the equation for cardiac output. It is heart rate times stroke volume. Heart rate being how many times your heart beats per minute, and stroke volume being how much blood is pumped out every time your heart beats. That is relatively straightforward. Then we want to start talking about how cardiac output is regulated. This part is pretty straightforward, right? If your heart rate goes up, cardiac output is going to go up. So that's easy. Um, you also just want to be aware of this term, cardiac reserve which is just the difference between your cardiac output at your resting heart rate versus your maximum heart rate. So now we have to get into other factors that regulate cardiac output by acting on stroke volume. And before we talk about stroke volume, we have another equation, um, or before we start changing stroke volume, we have an equation that we use to define what stroke volume is. Um, so it is end diastolic volume minus end systolic volume. So end diastolic means how much blood is in your ventricles when they are done relaxing. So it's the maximum amount of blood that starts out in your ventricles. Then they squeeze and you have a certain amount of blood left over after the squeeze. That is your end systolic volume. So if you take how much you started with and subtract what's left over, you get what got squirted out. So end diastolic volume minus end systolic volume equals stroke volume. Um, and these are also possible open-ended questions on the exam. When you are answering questions about effects on stroke volume, I want you to be able to use, we have them both, this equation here and that equation there. You don't have to write the whole equation, but if I say, well, you'll get a, uh, you'll get a sense as we go through. I'll just keep doing it. Um, so these are the three things we're going to talk about, venous return, contractility, and afterload. The first one we'll do is venous return. Included in venous return is this concept called preload. But what I'm going to ask you about physiologically is venous return. But first we have to describe what preload is. Preload is just how physically stretched out your cardiac muscle cells are. Yeah. This is similar to the stretch on your uh, skeletal muscles. If you recall, there's um, four skeletal muscles. They can generate the maximum amount of force between 80 and 120% of their resting length. Cardiac fibers are similar because they're striated, so they have the same arrangement of myosin and actin that skeletal muscles do. Um, so cardiac muscles are able to generate more strength if they're stretched out a little bit more than they would be at rest. So this preload leads to an increase in the strength of the contraction. Now we have to talk about venous return. So venous return affects two parts of our stroke volume equation. First of all, venous return means how much blood is being returned to the heart. So that's through your superior and inferior vena cava. That is going to increase your end diastolic volume. Now if you increase your end diastolic volume, you're packing more blood into the ventricles. You are going to stretch them out more. That is increasing the preload. So when you increase the preload, you get a stronger contraction. And when you have a stronger contraction, that is going to decrease your end systolic volume. So you're starting with more than you would normally you have less left over, which means this has a big effect on increasing your stroke volume. Um, 
And because increased venous return is so important for cardiac output, this is why things like um, staying hydrated and keeping a proper blood volume are so important because it, once you start to get dehydrated and you have less blood volume to begin with, it's harder to get it to return, um, and you lose a, car a lot of cardiac output when you start losing blood volume. So then we have contractility. As it says right here, contractile strength at a given muscle length, independent of preload. Um, I will give you an example of something that affects contractility so that it will make sense to you. So let's say somebody's heart is just sitting there. Um, all things are remaining the same. Venous return is the same, heart rate is the same, everything is the same, but you dump a little epinephrine on the heart. That is going to cause the heart to squeeze harder. So that right there is just a factor that can make the heart squeeze harder that doesn't have anything to do with preload. That we just call contractility. So if preload stays the same, meaning end diastolic volume is going to stay the same. You increase contractility, that means a harder squeeze, so you have less left over and your end, excuse me, and your stroke volume has gone up. And I'm always in a hurry because I know these things are boring, right? So on any one of these then, you want to say you know, contractility affects this side of the equation in that way. That causes an increase in stroke volume. If you get an increase in stroke volume, that increases cardiac output. Same thing with this slide, which I skip. Right? Increased venous return right? increases EDV, decreases ESV, which increases stroke volume. And if you increase stroke volume, you increase cardiac output. Yeah. So when we're talking about these factors, you want to explain this equation here um, in some detail and then make sure to reference how that change in stroke volume is going to affect cardiac output. Um, then contractility. Um, let's see. Oh, we are coming up on your discussion question for this week. We'll see how that goes. Uh, so these are factors that affect contractility. Here's one I already talked about, sympathetic stimulation. Um, so that's either your sympathetic nervous system dumping epinephrine on your heart, or it could be epinephrine from your adrenal medulla, which is technically part of your sympathetic nervous system, but we're calling it a hormone because it ends up in the bloodstream, but whatever. It came from a neuron. I'm calling it a, a neurotransmitter. Uh, but then also these two are traditional hormones, thyroxin and glucagon, and they both increase your cardiac output. Yeah. So if you think about what thyroxin does, thyroxin increases your body's metabolism. If you increase your body's metabolism, then your cells are going to need oxygen being supplied at a greater rate as well as glucose so you need to circulate the blood faster so that you get fresh blood to all of your tissues quicker. I want you all to think about why it is that glucagon should increase cardiac output. So think about the factors that cause glucagon to be released not what glucagon is trying to do, but why it gets released and why having glucagon or why having increased cardiac output would be a good idea under the conditions that cause glucagon to be released. So at the beginning, before glucagon has done what it's supposed to do, you want to increase your cardiac output. Why? That is your discussion question. Then we move to afterload. Afterload you can basically think of as blood pressure. This is the pressure in your atria. Not atria, excuse me, aorta. Right? So this is the amount of pressure that your ventricles have to generate before blood is going to leave the heart. So if you have increased blood pressure, it is harder to get blood out of the heart into the atrium. So your and systolic volume goes up. If your end systolic volume goes up, your stroke volume goes down. If your stroke volume goes down, your cardiac output goes down. So this is why hypertension is bad for you. It makes it harder to pump blood. And if you want to keep a constant cardiac output, then you have to increase either heart rate or contractility. And both of those put a strain on the heart. 
All right, so next up is uh, your nervous system's effect on the heart rate, um, parasympathetic and sympathetic. So the first thing you want to know is that it is the adrenal medulla here that regulates heart rate. There are cardio acceleratory and cardio inhibitory centers in the adrenal medulla. The parasympathetic nervous system is in charge of your cardio inhibitory centers, which is going to slow down your heart rate, causing what is called vagal tone, which is just decreased heart rate. Um, and you should see in the ECG worksheet that you're doing, if you read it carefully, the um, rate of depolarization of your SA node is actually faster than most people's resting heart rate. So what your parasympathetic nervous system is doing is inhibiting your sinoatrial node or slowing down its rate of depolarization so that your resting heart rate is slower than your sinoatrial node would have it be at rest. So then we move on to the sympathetic nervous system. So the sympathetic is in charge of your cardio acceleratory centers. And here we want to note that the sympathetic nervous system is dumping neurotransmitter on your sinoatrial and atrioventricular nodes. So it can affect your autorhythmic tissues, but it also can dump epinephrine directly onto the myocardium. So as we see, it can affect both heart rate and contractility. Right? Whereas if you look at the parasympathetic fibers, they're only going to the two nodes, the two uh, regulatory centers, and they don't affect contractility. Then, so now we're just getting into some review stuff. Let's see. Yeah, this is all review. We already talked about epinephrine and thyroxin. I would not worry about this at all. I never have time to ask questions about it, and I just like playing with my blue digital marker. This is too complicated for me to go into. Um, you should spend some time working with it. Diagrams do help people understand things. Um, and as people, we are visual creatures. We are built to understand the world visually. Um, so these kinds of diagrams are really good at um, helping us review material, even if the questions we're gonna get don't include pictures. Pictures just help us organize material. Um, so spend some time with that. And don't spend time with this guy here because that means you're dead. Um, I just found his picture somewhere on the internet and I totally stole it, violating copyright. I'm a horrible person. Um, but you just want to know what congestive heart failure is. So this is not a heart attack. This might be the final heart attack that just causes your heart to give up the ghost. This here, here is supposed to be a healthy heart, and this is a heart that came from somebody who I think drank and smoked too much. So that is hypertrophy. Um, that heart was working too hard for too long and got too big, and that just puts too much of a strain on it, and it makes it too hard for your body to deliver oxygen to all of the cells of the heart because the thicker the walls of your ventricles get, the harder it is to deliver oxygen to all of the cells. Your coronary circulation just doesn't grow as fast as your myocardium does, and you end up with um, cells dying because they go hypoxic, and that's what a heart attack or a myocardial infarct is. Uh, oh, there's more. Oh, wait, there's more. Um, this is a bypass. I won't ask any questions about it on the exam. It's just, I think, interesting thing, right? So if you've got a clog, here is your clog. Blood's not getting this way. It gets blocked. So they build a bypass graph, uh, graph so that you can bypass the uh, plaques in your coronary arteries. Um, another thing they can do if you have plaques in your coronary arteries is what is called angioplasty. So they take a catheter very long, thin, flexible plastic tube, and they run that up your femoral artery um, all the way up through your abdominal aorta, and then they get to the base of your abdominal aorta and somehow sneak it into your 
coronary arteries. How they do this, I do not know. But then they get it into the coronary artery that has the plaque. They inflate a balloon on the end, and that helps break up the plaque um, and makes the blood vessels more flexible. So it's not just about um, you know trying to widen the diameter, but it's about physically breaking up the plaque a little bit so that you restore some elasticity to the blood vessel walls, making blood flow through them easier. Um, they sometimes also insert stents, which are going to keep it open once you've pushed it open with your balloon. And the stents look something like this. Um, so they start out like this here, where they're collapsed, and then they're basically like, you know, like a, what's the word I'm looking for? like an umbrella that opens. Um, you insert the balloon and it looks like that, and then they just stay like that because they're made out of metal and the metal bends and expands into this new expanded shape. Um, and then that just stays lodged in an artery and keeps it open. Um, that's it. I th These are just pretty pictures that I put in there because I like pretty pictures, but I don't have anything to say about them. That's the end of the heart. 41 minutes.